Hi, I'm Dr. Lauren Hungler, a naturopathic doctor and creator of the Healthy AF Mom Show, the show that helps tired millennial moms regain control of their energy, calm the cravings, beat the bloat, improve their nightly Z's, live a greener, cleaner life, and help them to understand their postpartum bods and more. On today's episode, we're going to be chatting all about why your sleep might suck after having kids. And in this bite-sized episode, we're going to touch on three things. One is going to be what is sleep, two, what your sleepy hormone has to do with it, and three, how your nightly habits could be sabotaging your sleep experience. Before we jump in, I invite you to check out my 14-day body reboot, where one of our key pillars is going to be sleep. So with the coupon code HEALTHYAF15, you'll save 15% off this 14-day body reboot. It's an online self-guided program. And finally, if you're loving the podcast and you're enjoying the episodes, I'd love for you to subscribe and to leave a review on your favorite podcasting app or in your iTunes. In today's episode, we're going to be chatting all about why your sleep might suck after having kids. This is a really common concern that comes up for parents, for moms, for dads, for everyone in between. It can be a really difficult and challenging aspect that maybe before you had kids, you were a fantastic sleeper. You slept really well. You went to bed at a decent or reasonable time. You were able to stay asleep, woke up and felt rested upon waking. The challenging part is that lots of things change after having kids and sleep is a really big consideration. So what we're going to chat about today is six factors that I think could be sabotaging your sleep after having kids. So why do we need sleep? So sleep is essential. And I think we can all agree that we are much better parents after a night of fantastic sleep, right? You feel better energy. Your mood just feels really smooth. You have a better capacity to make good food choices and healthy food choices. You feel on point. You can focus. You can concentrate. You don't have the like afternoon lags and sluggishness. Sleep is a really important part. And so when we sleep at night, we have some like really big bodily functions that are happening. This is when your body is repairing all its tissue. This is when we're cultivating and accruing memories. Your nerve cells are communicating to each other. We're mobilizing proteins and enzymes. This is a time when your body really needs the time and the space to get you ready for the next day. And the hard part is, is that if you're having really inconsistent sleep, meaning that you're constantly waking up at night, or it's taking you forever to fall asleep so that you don't get very much and your deep sleep is really affected, then we're not having enough ample time in this stage and in this aspect of your biochemistry and physiology to allow your body to recharge. You want to think of your body a little bit like your phone. When that battery gets down to like 5%, you have to plug it in. Sleep is that version. Sleep is you plugging yourself in, giving yourself that recharge and that time to feel better, to have your body ready for the next day. If we're not charging you up or we're just giving you little snippets and tidbits, you're going to feel that the next day. So what we want to chat about is like, how does sleep work? How does sleep function? Because sometimes when we understand the physiology and how your hormones are cycling, we can really understand how we can interrupt some of those patterns or how some of our habits or our lifestyle changes can impact this cycling, this natural cycling that we experience. When we were cave people or back in back in days of old, what really happens is that your signaling for wake or night times was always predicated on what the light was doing outside. So under white and blue spectrums of light, that light enters your eye, hits your optic nerve, sends those signals up and says like, hey guys, daylight, let's roll. And so your body creates that stimulation. We feel awake. We feel on point. It increases our hormone cortisol, our heart rate and our blood pressure increase. And we're kind of like ready for the day. The same thing happens in the evening as light would diminish and we'd get these red or orange spectrums of light, these darker hues. Those interact with your eye. Again, send that message up to your brain. Your penile gland starts to produce melatonin and that's going to be your sleepy hormone or the standard for your body to say, Ready guys, it's bedtime. You move into a parasympathetic nervous state or you're resting and digesting. This increases GABA and other really calming neurotransmitters and it helps you to fall asleep. And in a perfect world, we have these sleep wake cycles and your body has built a capacity to understand when that's happening, why it's happening, and really likes consistency when it comes to this cycle. So when we think about the factors that could be affecting your sleep, 
usually these are going to be a factors that affect certain aspects of your sleep wake cycles, right? So the first factor we're going to talk about is number one is establishing a nighttime routine. And the reason that we do this is because we want to like tell your body it's time for bed. We have this interesting idea that we can like run at turbo speed all day into the night, doing laundry, making dinner, working on a project, finishing up whatever household task we have. And then we're like, okay, it's time for bed. I can't. And then we come in and we complain that like you can't fall asleep at night. And it's like, well, you didn't tell your body it was time for bed. We didn't even tell it that it was even near sleep time. You went go, 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 go until the moment your head hit the pillow. So we really need to establish a routine of that, like setting a relaxing setting, setting up a calm experience for your body so that it gets ready and it knows what's coming, that you're ready to go to bed. You're ready to have a really great sleep. And so we want to really establish this nighttime routine. So especially after having kids, it feels like we have all these things on our to-do list. We have no time to do them in it. And so we start doing things later into the evening after our kids go down. I want you to be really cognizant and conscious of do those things actually have to get done? Are there things that are actually priority that need to get done and maybe the other things can get done tomorrow or on the weekend? Or can we delegate some of those things? So making sure we have a nice nighttime routine, looking at making sure your room is really dark. So not having any artificial um, or white or blue spectrum, green spectrum lights that are visible. So on your alarm clock or from your phone. We'll talk about scrolling next. So we want to make sure that there's no extra light in your room. You want to make sure it's nice and cool. So whether that's with a fan, um, having your window cracked open just a little bit, making sure it's a cool, dark room to sleep in. Our bodies are really big fan of that. If you need something where you need a bit of ambient noise as well, so a sleep machine or a sound machine can be really helpful to hear waves, hear the sound of a fan, something to kind of just increase the amount of ambient noise in your room, that can be another strategy. You could also add in other sleep aids. So doing a deep breathing or a guided meditation before you're going to bed. Again, putting you into that parasympathetic nervous state, that resting and digesting, that really amazing place where your body is like, yep, it is time for sleep. Essential oils can fit into this category as well. So if you really love a diffuser, adding in something like lavender or vetiver can be a really great addition into your nighttime routine. And so doing something consistently and regularly for your nighttime space and for your nighttime routine can be essential to really establish that sleep-wake cycle and establish your circadian rhythm. Number two, when we're going to talk about the factors that are probably affecting your sleep and really tend to impact you is going to be the scrolling or the doom scroll. As much as I want to say like, yeah, just keep scrolling till the moment you go to bed. The problem with this is that we're adding in more of that white spectrum light. So when we're talking about how your body knows when it's time to go to bed, if you have bright white lights plastered to your face before you go to bed, whether that's a tablet, that could be a computer screen, a TV screen, your phone. If it's constantly in your face, your eyes are interpreting that signal that like, oh no, it's not, it's not bedtime. This is wake time. You increase your cortisol, you're going to increase your wakefulness and you're going to basically stimulate your body. And so this is not the place we want to be right? So we want to be really mindful of the amount of light that we're being exposed to just before bed. And so this is where our recommendation of that 30 to 40 minutes before bed to turn off any screens. This isn't just professionals saying like being mean and being like, you can't Pinterest at 10 o'clock at night. At the end of the day, I want you to support your sleep. And I understand that your kids just went down. You want some gosh darn space and time to yourself. But at the end of the day, prioritizing sleep and the the amazing impact that sleep can have on your health, sometimes we need to prioritize that so that we can feel our best. And so putting a time limit or putting a scroll limit on our phone, um, establishing that experience where we take screens out of our room for about 30 minutes before we're going to bed can make a huge difference on your sleep quantity and sleep quality. Because once we get that white light out of there and you're adding in those dark spectrum lights, we've added in this ambient room temperature and room environment. It really impacts the amount of melatonin that you're producing and really supports your calm and restful hormones. Number three that we're going to chat about in regards to like a factor that's probably affecting your sleep that's making it epically worse. And I'm sorry, it's going to be the booze. 
it's alcohol. So when it comes to alcohol, again, it's going to impact your hormones. And so what alcohol can actually do is it can actually reduce melatonin and lower melatonin, that sleepy hormone, and can actually instigate an increased cortisol, which is going to be our wakeful, more stimulating hormone. The opposite of what we want our body to understand that we want or that we need and that we are doing at that moment. So alcohol can be a really challenging aspect. And so a lot of people actually use it as a way to fall asleep, right? So we have a glass of wine. Maybe we have um, a beer or a cider before we're going to bed that helps us to feel a lot more calm. And then you're like, that helps me to sleep so much better. The challenging part here is that you probably might fall asleep better. The likelihood is that you don't stay asleep. And I think most of us can comment on a, on most times when we drink that when we have that sleep, we never feel rested the next day and it feels like we were up more consistently in the night. That's because it's messing with your hormones and it's messing with your circadian rhythm and that sleep-wake cycle. So the goal is to stop drinking at least three hours before your bedtime. So it's not that you can't have any alcohol and we can't enjoy a glass of wine or you know a glass of whiskey or something like that. You just want to be mindful of maybe timing now. So why not have a drink before dinner while we're cooking, having a glass of wine and having that experience then, or maybe having it with dinner or just after trying to get it at least three hours before you're going to bed to help to improve that sleep wake cycle and improve your hormones, responsiveness and communication. Number four, we're going to talk about in regards to things that are probably sabotaging your sleep after having kids is staying up really late and not being mindful of what time we're going to bed. And this is probably one of the hardest ones that I find for people because we tend to covet that time, right? The kids are down. Maybe I've stopped work. I've obviously stopped work for the day. I need that space and time to myself. And so we get really engrossed in this concept and we want to have our own space and our own time. And usually we start staying up really late. A lot of the times either and most often watching Netflix or scrolling on our devices. And so we want to get more consistent with your bedtime um, sleep time. It's not that you can't have outliers where you're going to bed maybe a little bit later on a weekend, but on a consistent basis, say 80% of the time, you're hitting the sack and hitting the hay at the same time every night. So whether that's 10 or 1030, ideally you want to be somewhere around there is making sure that we're being consistent with our bedtime and not kind of bouncing around and going to bed at eight one day and then going to bed at midnight the next day. Your body is not a big fan of that. We like cyclicalness. We like regularity. We're big fans of it. Just like when you're very cognizant and very attentive to how your children and how, or how your baby sleeps where you're like, it has to be dark. We have to have a sleep sack. It's got to be this perfect room temperature. There has to be like the one wave sound has to be going for a baby to sleep. And we're like so anal about our kids' sleep routines. And then it comes to us and we're just like willy nilly out there in the wind. We want to be really respectful that your body also requires this for better quality sleep. And so if you've been into like the Netflix and we've been binge watching something, I want you to just like take the step back. I always give the example of, would you let your kids stay up and watch 10 episodes of Paw Patrol because they needed to know what happened to Mayor Goodway? Like she can't just stay up in that bubble forever. We have to save Mayor Goodway. I need to watch at least 10 episodes of Paw Patrol to make sure that she's okay. And you would absolutely say no. You'd be like, listen, we will press pause. We will find out what happens tomorrow. We can always look at it and experience, have that experience with the show and we can enjoy it. It doesn't have to all happen tonight. We need to have like the same rules and regulations for ourselves when it comes to screen time at night. And so making sure that we're turning off the TV, we're turning off our scrolling, but turning off Netflix as well and making sure we're getting to bed an appropriate time can really be beneficial at improving that quantity and quality of sleep. I want you to have alone time. I want you to have self-love. Maybe there's other places in the day that we can find maybe little pieces of that. A five-minute deep breathing, maybe reading a book, having a quiet tea by yourself, finding the things that we find enjoyable and have a great experience with and putting those into our day so that you don't feel like you need to jam pack it all in at night between eight and midnight because we always just end up staying up later. And our last one that we're going to chat about in regards to factors that are probably sabotaging your sleep is eating and snacking late at night. Again, this becomes a really consistent habit for us where we get kids down, we get downstairs, we turn on the TV, and then we go to snack. 
whether that's popcorn, having some chips, maybe some candies, whatever it is, it can be a really challenging thing for people to do. And so the tricky part with food is that if you're eating before bed and having that late night snack is that again, we're confusing your body. Your body has just said like, okay, we're ready for sleep. This is happening. We're going to do this thing. And then you're like, oh, P.S., you're going to go digest like pasta or we're going to digest like eight cups of popcorn because I just like smashed a bag. And so now your body's response is like, oh, it's not sleep time. I'm supposed to be digesting. I'm going to be doing this thing over here. And unfortunately, when we ask our bodies to do multiple things at once, we don't do either one very well. We do them, but just not to the degree that they should be done. And so when we're digesting late into the night, you usually don't sleep very well either. We don't get that good quality. We can't get back into our REM or into our deep sleep states. And so this can affect that quality or that feeling rested when you're waking in the morning because you've been snacking and eating and your body's been digesting all night that it forgot to do all the repair work. It forgot to mobilize and get ready the end enzymes and proteins and hormones for the next day. It did some of it, just not all of it. And so being really mindful of when you stop eating can be really essential for getting better quality sleep. So the goal here is usually between two and three hours before you're going to bed. And I would aim for at least three hours. So making sure we're not having any food or having any alcohol two to three hours before you're going to bed can make a really big impact on the quantity and quality of sleep that you're having. So those are our big five factors that I want you to consider seeing if we can add a little bit of change, add a little bit of habit consistency when it comes to your sleep. And really, honestly, it's about making sleep a priority, knowing that the sleep you get tonight can really impact your day tomorrow. It can impact your energy. It impacts your mood. It can certainly impact our hormones and our PMS and our regularly cycling female hormones. Because guess what? Those cycle regularly too. And when we're throwing everything out of whack, it usually affects that as well. It affects your exercise and your recovery. It affects the food choices that we make. Usually if we're sleeping poorly and feeling more tired, we tend to reach for more carbohydrate and more processed and rich fatty and salty foods to help make us feel more awake and help us to give that, give us that energy boost, even though in the long run, it doesn't make us feel better. So getting good quality sleep and prioritizing sleep should be at the top of your list when it comes to really solidifying and making your health the best it can be. Because sleep at the end of the day is going to be the way that we optimize your health. Yay, you made it to the end of the episode. If you enjoyed today's show, I'd love for you to hit that subscribe button and to leave a review. And if you felt inspired by anything you heard today, I'd love to share with you a few ways to get started to feel like a healthy AF mom. So in the show notes below, I've left links to some of my favorite challenges. There's a five day slay all day smoothie challenge, a get hella hydrated challenge, and a know your labs challenge. All amazing ways that you can get started to feel like your epic version of yourself today. I also have an awesome coupon code. It's healthy AF 15, all caps, and that's a 15% off discount to my 14 day body reboot. Again, it's linked in the show notes below. And finally, I love to get social. So if you wanted to follow me or leave me a comment or review, you can find me on Instagram and YouTube and TikTok at dr.lauren.nd. I'll see you there.